Hello and welcome to the Evolving Spiritual Practice Podcast. My name is Ralph Cree. This is brought to you in association with bodyheartmindspirit.co.uk. Today I spoke to Anna Greer about her journey with chronic fatigue syndrome and how that has coincided with her spiritual journey, her spiritual path in her life. She has been on a journey with chronic fatigue syndrome for 34 years. Uh, so she has a lot of wisdom to share on the subject as well as a lot of practices that she now puts into place to um, well live with that condition and um, thrive now so uh, she's obviously like most people tried a billion different things um, and has sort of landed on some core principles that she's put into place in her life which really apply to almost anybody wanting to live um, a healthy life and we explore fatigue as a kind of metaphor for the psychology of late stage capitalism Um, I'm sure uh, most people who listen to this uh, podcast would feel some sympathy towards this feeling of overwhelm and um, burnouts that we're all experiencing in uh, the modern world Um, lots of pressures on us all uh, and uh, these can all lead to chronic fatigue fatigue syndrome so much wisdom that Anna's shared on this subject uh, and I hope you enjoy Anna Greer welcome to the um Evolving Spiritual Practice podcast. Well, thank you for having me, Ralph. It's an honour to be here. Yeah, great. Um, So we we knew each other a bit uh, a long time ago. Um, Used to come to some drumming workshops when I was doing more of that kind of thing. I used to do drumming, African drumming workshops and stuff like that. And we met at one of those and you came to some more sessions and got to know each other a little bit about that and then there's a a long break and we reconnected again around um an interest in spirituality really and and those kind of things yeah absolutely in fact you gave me some one-to-one lessons you might have forgotten that but oh no i remember that yeah yeah, that was some of where our kind of more deeper conversations getting to know each other were (laughs) yes exactly yeah it's difficult in in a large group (laughs) actually people are drumming yeah um so the what we we're going to talk about today is um chronic fatigue syndrome yeah that's right and um you have your own podcast um mm-hmm. which is called the fatigue files is that correct that's right yeah yeah and i've listened to several episodes of that and it's a really good podcast particularly if people have chronic fatigue syndrome and um you know just to kind of set the scene for the way i've encountered chronic fatigue syndrome in in my own life um is i've just noticed more and more uh through my life encountering people with chronic fatigue syndrome in in all its different manifestations talking openly about it uh, you know there's been more in the media um you've had celebrities who've had it politicians all these kind of people which obviously puts it a bit more on the map but when i was when i was a kid um in the 80s and i, I remember there was, a, there was a, a a kid at school that had i get some kind of chronic fatigue thing i think we called it me back in yeah. those days and he had to take like a year off school and then he came back and was uh you know back a year in school um and it was all a bit mysterious you know people didn't really understand it uh or at least what we didn't as young people back then um but it seems to be it's more and more common um for whatever reasons that you could probably explain um and the i think in terms of where it intersects with spirituality and the alternative lifestyle scene uh you know health and wellness 
off-grid living, spirituality, that kind of thing. I don't know. I mean, you, you know, and I'd be interested to hear you comment on this. Are is it are is there more people in that scene that experience chronic fatigue syndrome versus people in mainstream society? Uh, this this is just there seem to be quite a lot of people um, I've encountered in that world mm. uh, who have this um, condition. Can we use that word for what? Yeah, would you, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know whether I'm getting a, a skewed sample of, of the whole thing um, or whether people in mainstream society encounter chronic fatigue syndrome, find it <clears throat> uh, for whatever you know reason that the, the mainstream society doesn't quite understand it in the way they want to. And suddenly they find themselves on the alternative side of the street in terms of health and wellness, um, lifestyle, those kind of things, wanting to get out of the rat race and those sort of things that they feel are draining them. So um, that's just a little uh, picture of the very, very basic encounter I've had with it. In okay. my life. And, and I wonder if you could comment a couple, you know, just to begin with on a couple of those things I've raised. Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> it's actually called by some people ME stroke CFS. So ME stands for mild encephalomyelitis and CFS stands for chronic fatigue syndrome. There are some other names for it too. And it's been around for quite a long time. There, there are even stories or speculations, Ralph, that Florence Nightingale had it after she got back from the Crimea. She was mysteriously ill and I believe never left her bedroom again. Um, but one of the most famous um, things was a massive outbreak at the Royal Free Hospital in about 1955 which is when it really hit the headlines and um, something like 250 doctors and nurses came down with it at the same time. Now, one of the theories, of course, is that there's a viral agent involved. And, you know, for a vast number of people who get this, it is a post-viral thing that either they have a virus and they're a bit post-viral for a while and they get better, which wouldn't count as chronic fatigue syndrome or ME, just be post-viral fatigue. Um, and this is one of the reasons why some people think long COVID is very similar to MECFS. Um, there are people who never get uh, never get well again. And that's kind of like what people think of as the kind of long running syndrome. And it is mysterious in the sense that the symptoms come and go and they people can have experiences of very differing degrees of severity. So there'll be some people who are literally bed bound literally bed bound for years and I was more or less circling a bed for the first two years of my illness and then there are other people who kind of limp along and they seem like they're functionally coping they get to work they might take more days off than anyone else but at home they're absolutely wiped so the picture's very varied the reason why in my view it's becoming more prevalent is because we are living in ways that are completely out of touch with the fundamental needs of human well-being at a biological, mental, emotional and spiritual level. And so bodies generally are under, st under stress and pressure. The same is true for ecosystems, the same is true for planetary life. We can think of fatigue as a kind of metastructure that lands in the lives of some more than others. And I always think that people with chronic fatigue, in a way, are like a canary in a mine for I think you called it everyday people. I come up with people living in the everyday world. I don't know how you phrased it. But anyway, people living in the kind of normal 21st century rhythms. There, a lot of them are headed in this direction because the way we live is fundamentally at odds with our needs as evolved animals. So our biology. I mean, Ralph, think about it. If there was any other mammalian species where so many animals were getting so ill, You'd look at it and you go, what's in their environment? What's happening? You wouldn't just look at individuals and give them pills. And so this is a kind of species level thing, but it's much more prevalent, obviously, in the global north, in highly capitalistic westernized societies where pressures are internalized. So to answer your question about the link with spirituality, it's a massive wake up call. When you get put into bed really, really seriously ill, you do tend to have nowhere to go but your psyche. 
you do tend to have to face some quite deep questions about how you got there, what it all means. And there are some people who just suffer and there are other people who in their suffering find something deeper. And in my experience of working with people with chronic fatigue syndrome, yes, quite a number of those people are actually on awakening paths. Um, and that's something I, of, I often discuss with clients. If I, if I feel that that's part of their journey that they might not even have clued into fully, that's something I bring out because there's nothing so transformative in relation to chronic illness than actually being able to get to the point where you're radically content, peaceful and blissful, no matter what the hell is going on in your body. Mm. So um, do you think, you know, you're saying the conditions of our uh, late, of late stage capitalism late stage capitalist world that we're all we're all actually living whether wherever you're living on the planet you're part of this because mm -hmm. uh, it you know pollution and those kind of things don't respect borders um uh, so the people that are getting chronic fatigue syndrome would you say they're particularly sensitive people and then you know when you think of people that get into spirituality and alternative health and wellness and those kind of things you might describe those as particularly sensitive people too. Is there, is there a link there? I think for some people there might be a link there, but I think a lot of people I wouldn't describe as particularly sensitive come down with this as well. I mean, you know, I think there are lots of roots in. It's a multi-systemic hmm. condition. Yeah, sure, a, vi a virus, you know, anyone could get a virus and get post-viral fatigue. That's um, right. Yeah. But, but some people, once they clear the virus, their body has more total allostatic load on it than the body can cope with so they might sort of if you did tests you might think oh yeah they've they've got the virus out of the system but meanwhile they've got a high glyphosate load or they've got a heavy metal toxic load or they've got intense emotional stress or they've got deep unconscious issues that stem from very early in childhood that actually create incredible tensions in the system and if there's one thing that conditions like MECFS teach us is that there is no mind body dualism we are one complex emergent system in which there are multiple tipping points and those multiple tipping points into the condition are you know environmentally endemic as you say and global because of globalized neoliberal capitalist structures and as you say the outputs of that in pollution don't respect borders so you've got that and then you've got the fact that the body itself as a highly intelligent system of systems, responds through these signalings that we call symptoms that are actually profound forms of communication. And if I've learned anything on my journey, especially working with clients, it's to trust absolutely the wisdom of the body. There's nothing broken about the bodies of those who are ill with fatigue. They are in a situation where the body is in suboptimal conditions. It's not able to function in the way that they would like it to or that the body itself is designed to. But the symptoms they're getting are highly intelligent modes of communication. And so part of the practical art of working with things like chronic fatigue syndrome is learning to understand the body, both at an intuitive level, at an experiential level, and in terms of health optimization science. We have to get a little bit geeky because... The science shows us the stunning complexity of the intelligence of the body and gives us lots of markers and ways of understanding what's going on. And most of it leads back to very fundamental things that are intrinsic to human well-being that have to do with the fact that our cells evolved millennia before we arrived on the scene with neocortical functioning, for example. Um, and it is very humbling and beautiful because it links to the fact that there's a beautiful intelligence at work in reality with which we can coordinate, cooperate, and to which we can surrender. Yeah, that's um, a theme that's come up on this podcast a fair bit is the story, the narrative that you live within um, mm -hmm. is, is so important that you, you, can, you can live with a really shit story in your life um, or in a, so you've got a situation, um, you can have a, a, a story that 
frames it in a way where you feel disempowered, you feel victimized, um, uh, it's a sort of life of misery, or you can, you can, some people, and you see this in the example exemplified in the lives of different people, how they react to different situations, and you think, oh, how would I be in that situation? Uh, other people, for whatever, however they manage to do it, you know, through the grace of whatever, are able to have a story where they're empowered, it's meaningful, and, and I think this is where spirituality comes into it. And I was thinking that in life, uh, to use sort of Indian goddesses, some people get to have Kali as their goddess in life, and some people get to have Lakshmi. Their Kali is sort of hardcore goddess um and lakshmi is sort of you know wealth and prosperity and good fortune and stuff and you don't necessarily get to choose really who your main teacher is in life of of, of the kind of spectrum of goddesses and gods and you know if, if you happen to get kali uh in your life um as as your as your as your teacher um the story you t t tell about that you know you we, we kind of go through these phases of w when you're in a situation you have all the kind of you fight it but then i mean some people will fight it for the whole of their lives and that's just a life of struggle but what you're indicating is that uh, and from when we've talked before there's some there's a shift that can happen where you can say okay carly is the goddess in my life um and um loads of people have learned to worship kali and be extremely grateful and kali is a goddess for good reason because she's extremely powerful and brings great benefits in your life if you understand how to uh, work with her or even become her um so what would you what would you say to that well i think ralph there is an element of like any extreme experience and my experience when I was first ill and that points in the illness have been very extreme like really really intense um there's a sense in that the kind of Carly vibe that you're talking about is where the sense of identity that you've always previously had is in some sense challenged and ultimately destroyed now you you know, you reference the fact that people can frame things in different ways. We all live in different reality tunnels. Um, and some of that's deeply unconscious. So, you know, I, I know people who choose consciously to frame things well, but unconsciously they've got all sorts of drivers that make that yeah. really, really difficult for them, right? What I've learned increasingly in my own client-based work and as a hypnotist is how plastic reality really is and how flexible the self is. Um, and it really fits with spiritual practice in the sense that, you know, my understanding of spirituality, and I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but I'm on my path, um, is that of course I can work with Anna, the construct, you know, Anna, the, the certain version of a history that's that's been there since the womb onwards. Anna, the pattern of, you know, ingrained responses and some inherited and developed reactivities, the thought patterns, the, the voice, the talky-talky in the head, the, the story of Anna. I can work with that skillfully and I can learn how plastic it is and I can learn how to evolve that intelligently in ways that make living with embodied discomforts and all the rest of it easier, more gracious, more meaningful. But of course, ultimately, we we know that we're not that. We know that we're actually this awakened, beautiful, observing, witnessing, silent consciousness. And my own journey with chronic fatigue has been a sort of mixture of learning how to work very expertly with all of that, including the body, while at the same time learning how limited, how plastic, how malleable all that is. And underneath it, behind it, when you go deep enough and suffering can really drive you down to the very ground of being, right? There's this beautific space of love in which everything is always fundamentally okay. And with clients, I find it 
inviting them to surrender to that, to fall back behind all the stories into that, so that they literally become the space and the awareness in which the phenomena of the symptoms arise is one of the most liberating moments because that's the moment at which you stop fighting. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean you stop dancing intelligently with what the body and all the rest of it's telling you and learning from the world and responding to the environment. That's just skillful means, right? So that's like really important part of the work. And that's where it gets deeply practical, Ralph, you know, calming and settling the nervous system. Because let's face it, a lot of people who choose to frame things in a certain way and they're unconsciously driven by something else it's because their nervous system when they were just a tiny little nervous system with no capacity to self-regulate was dysregulated by dysre dysregulated adults and that the brain generalizes that as a prediction that then the person goes through life with certain patterns of being that they think are them they think it makes up part of their identity which is in fact the settling of their nervous system at a certain point when they were very, very pre-verbal, pre-conscious. And of course, we can work with all of that. We can actually change that. We can actually get into synaptic change work, nervous system work. We know that the body's cellular structures re kind of are recycled every, you know, different parts diff for every number of months. I can't remember all the precise numbers, but we know that we're we think of ourselves as something, you know, tangible, stable, which in a sense we are. But in another sense, we're just circulating systems of cells that are rising and dying. And, you know, it's kind of exciting to think of the mutability, flexibility and possibilities of the self, even as we know that there's this beautiful sense in which we're also not that. Yeah. So you're you're describing uh what you might call a paradigm shift in your response to a, this situation and a and a paradigm shift can happen uh through lots of different means you know working through your body so you you, you th through no fault of your own no doing of your own you're in a situation um and also a lot of the story you tell us you, you tell yourself about the situation you didn't create that story it comes from physical uh, occurrences right from you know being an embryo and stuff and then you've got social conditioning or you know you, you you wake up you find yourself in a situation where you 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 realize the story the paradigm you're living within about this illness and life and all of that kind of stuff um it's not a good one it's not working and there and there are options for a, a different paradigm to shift all this in and there are things you can do um to change that story um and we'd i'd love to explore that in a bit uh you've you've got lots of different practices that you do and you've developed through your tinkering over the years with this with this journey of yours um and i th i think you know one of the we could uh, it'd be nice to, to hear some of your story uh, with this illness and how that's coincided with your spiritual journey. Um, and I think ultimately, I don't know, you know, how you would t t talk about this, um, but framing the a, a chronic fatigue syndrome. So somebody's got chronic fatigue syndrome. How how might they turn that into a, I mean, a spiritual journey yeah um, think, ultimately that's if you think i think lots of christian saints uh and not even saints but people in the world of christianity have been examples of that it, you, you know that kind of life of difficulty turning that into a deeply religious experience so it is possible because history is yeah. littered with people that have done it yep. and you're an example of someone who's done it so the, the kind of goal of this podcast is to transmit some of that wisdom from you to people that are on the no pressure then <laughs> you know people who are at any stage along this journey they might have just someone might be listening to this who's just just encountered chronic fatigue syndrome or someone mm. might know a family member 
that's got it or someone they care about uh, or someone might be kind of just on the cusp of having been fighting it for a long time and thinking I need to reframe this you know so yeah yeah I mean I think it's an invitation um and that it's an invitation that operates at different layers so if you feel like you're just coming into it it's an invitation to wake the hell up and not go there honestly <laughs> if, I, if I could have avoided it I would um and there are ways to avoid it and we can talk about that um if it's around someone in your life who's got it it's it's very hard to be around someone with this condition ralph it's very hard because because their symptoms fluctuate they have a very complex symptomology um and they might look fine one day and the next day look like they're dying and they can suddenly hit a wall they can you know i've experienced this myself but i'm sure some of the listeners who are dealing with fatigue will recognize this you're in the middle of doing something and it's like you hit a wall and there's no energy. It just drops straight up your body. When it's bad, it's like having really bad flu 24 seven. And, you know, the word fatigue is a crappy word for such a profound level of debility. Mm. Um, and the invitation there, if you're around someone who's suffering from it is to be a space, be an atmosphere in which, they can start to feel that they're seen, heard and felt because many of my clients live with a partner or in a family or, and some of them live alone. Quite a large number of these people, including myself, end up living alone. It's, it's almost easier to live alone because then you've got no other demands. You can, you can go with the rhythms of your body without anyone saying, oh, come on, just stay up another hour or <laughs> the sort of things we do when we want to spend time with people. Um, but that's an invitation to extend a space of real attunement to someone because a lot of people with this are deeply lonely even in groups of people because there's a fundamental solitude in the experience which is very profound and one of the one of the beautiful things is I run a program online one of the beautiful things that the group dimension of that brings is people who are otherwise very lonely get to feel heard felt and attuned to for the period we're together and that is intrinsically healing so to those who are around people with chronic fatigue syndrome stop saying i get tired too stop saying you sure it's not in your head um listen and if they even if you don't understand it doesn't matter that you don't understand they're giving you their experience attuned to that be the loving space in which perhaps that trans that experience can begin to transform in an atmosphere of non-conditional, non-judgmental, positive regard, very therapeutic space to bring someone into. Um, and then obviously the thing that you said there about, you know, Christian saints and the transfigurative path of suffering is very profound. There, You're right, there is in Christianity a very deep strand of transfigurative suffering, not least through the example of Jesus Christ himself, who died on a cross, which is at the centre of the Christian faith in order to, you know, die, be resurrected and all the rest of it. But transfigurative suffering is a very powerful strand. I don't know how I feel about it though, Ralph, um, because I, I actually feel that you don't need to suffer to grow, but, that, but that's me and that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. But bring it back to my story. I was a, a long-term practicing Christian before I got ill. I was- oh, I just want to second that. That, yes. That's not that's not my, uh, you know, that that's a rather macho um, way of looking at it, uh, you know. Yeah, as if, I, as, if, as if you can't learn in other ways. Yes. And I think, uh, you know, just on the point, it, if you visit a, a Christian cathedral, whether it's, you know, anywhere in, in, in uh, Europe, for example, they're just littered with unhappy looking people. Um, <laughs> it, the iconography, you know, just all the statues that adorn the walls, the paintings, all of that stuff. And when yeah. you go to um, Tibet, uh, India, Thailand, you, you go to some, some Buddhist temples, there's lots of kind of smiling, content looking iconography everywhere. Yes. And we're all living in the same world. Uh, you know, and, and those are two different aesthetic 
forms of, of the religious view mm -hmm. and uh yeah so I, I i think probably christianity as a religion i'm going to vastly generalize here uh probably if this is the right word like valorizes suffering um a bit more than other religions yeah i think part of that comes from platonic christianity when the early church was really drawn to neoplatonist ideas which had a very negative view of the body and you know the west has inherited this through you know things like the mind body split of descartes and even although it takes a different form kantian and you know kantian and neo-kantian philosophy there is in the west a very um suspicious relationship with the body in the sense that in the church the early church the body was to be mortified you know self-flagellation you know sex was seen as somehow intrinsically fleshly and a little bit animalistic whereas actually I don't know about you Ralph and I'm sure some of your listeners but certainly for me sex is sacred and sexual energies powerful amazing transcendent sexual energies are part of my my path my transformative path an intrinsic part of my spiritual um experience if you like so so there's something there in christianity that's quite anti-body which is very ironic because if you think about it a faith built on the idea that a body died and physically rose from the dead and that that physical resurrection opens the door to the kind of death of the sting of death right death where is your sting you have no more power for that faith which is profoundly embodied and the Judaism that preceded it was very corporeal. You know, God would speak about stench in the nostrils, trees clap their hands. It's all very kind of somatic language for Christianity then to become this sort of slightly body loathing thing was a, a, a real aberration, I think, and a massive mistake. And I, I agree, like the misery in it, but it's not, you know, going to resist the urge to swear but it's not surprising if you're repressing some of those powerful libidinous energies that actually are part of how we flourish in the world they're part of who we show up as and if if that intrinsic part of the self is demonized and repressed it's not surprising then that the body develops syndromes and that people look really miserable and you know i grew up in catholicism educated by nuns who were highly suspicious of anything even vaguely resembling sexual arousal or anything around sex. Um, you know, it's quite hardcore. They were called the Sisters of Mercy, which I always thought was hilariously <laughs> misnamed. Um, but that was definitely part of my early awareness throughout that story, living in that story, with, with grandparents who practiced sexual abstention, you know, and, and the sort of sense i had of their frustration as characters that was all there in the background very early on so yeah I, like and i th i think that um we're going off a little bit of a tangent here but we're going to get back to your story but the um that way of looking at the body that ideology has kind of as a parasite lived on inside the scientific materialist totally. worldview that you know, science claims it's neutral and it's just looking at things objectively, but smuggled in to this supposedly objective view. I mean, maybe the scientific method, you know, you could say was completely uh, objective, but the way people interpret the scientific method and the, and the worldview that we grow up with is this kind of dead, meaningless, mm -hmm. random, billiard ball universe. Yeah, I mean, I'm caricaturing it, but that's the standard western education uh you know in the 20th century at least yeah newtonian was, cartesian was, world yeah it was that uh, which kind of carries forward that idea you know and way of seeing the body and of course you've got all sorts of scientists nowadays who are into uh, you know alternative health and well-being they're, they're telling a different story about the body through a scientific yeah uh, using scientific language and those kind of things absolutely um yeah it's just an interesting point so let's get to, let's get to your your mm -hmm. story um so where where did all this begin with you 
Well, it's, that's a very interesting question because stories could take thousands of forms depending where you start on it, right? So, yeah. um, for me, the story I think begins in the womb because I was almost miscarried and I was soaked with my mother's stress hormones in Aden. She was living in a an environment she was terrified of, so that was all there in my system. And the first day I was out of her womb, we were bombed by mortar rockets. I was effectively born in a kind of quasi war zone, an ongoing rumbling conflict in South Yemen, that then the British Protectorate of Aden. So I think that's where the story starts in the sense that, that set my system up in a very particular way. As a kiddie, I was a bit wild and I was a good girl, you know, but I was a bit wild. But at the age of six, I had my first mystical experience. When I was 14, I had a Satori experience on a mountain. All this time, I was physically very able. I was really indistinguishable from a boy in many ways um I was a bit of a kind of internalized lad I think because my father had wanted a son and I was just I loved all the boy things I loved swinging out of trees fighting using my body jumping around being athletic and all that stuff and that kind of went through then um I was quite devout Catholic I had a very strong sense of vocation um and then when I went to university I converted to evangelical Christianity got filled with the Holy Spirit in a charismatic setting. So that was an experience of like light, quivering, eyelids, eyelids fl fluttering, speaking another language that wasn't my own. Um, and then kind of stayed in that for quite a long time. We would do routinely do things like cast demons out of people, which I now see in a very different way, exercising prophecy, having what we would think of as words of knowledge, but are actually kind of, non-cognitive ways of knowing intuitively information which I think all humans and some animals have a capacity to do but anyways so that was there and then it was in that context that um, I got really really ill I was in a difficult marriage at the time um, and I got I, I had this growing sense of pressure from that relationship and other things and I knew instinctively I felt that I was being pushed towards some sort of edge and I kept trying to articulate it and I didn't know how to stop my inner drivers. I was practicing martial arts three times a week, um, doing a lot of stuff, highly energetic. Um, and then I went away for a weekend with my husband and two friends and the husband of my friend, Gail, he got ill at the same time as me. We both got a really violent gastric flu. It was so bad that I spent two days on the toilet praying to live. It was really, really bad. Um, and he got better and I never did. I remember going into the garden to play with my children once I was out of bed and just feeling really dizzy and not fully in my own body, just really, really strange. And being a type A personality, you know, internalized the military, internalized Catholicism, my body was just a lump of meat that I drove around, you know. I kept pushing and in the end completely collapsed. And that's when I spent the next two years more or less circling a bed, didn't have a diagnosis for a long time. Um, and this was in the times, when was this? This would have been 89, 1991, around then. About six months after my father died, I'm shit with dates. Um, and that's when I started having very extreme spiritual experiences that I had no framework for. So one day I was in my living room meditating, cross-legged on the floor. Everything went completely dark and then a door opened and this pure white light shone out of it and a voice said come in I must have gone in I don't know what that meant but you know I there was a willingness um, and the next thing I knew I was surrounded by the light heat you know my eyelids were fluttering tears streaming down my face and I had a, an explosion of energy from the base of my spine all the way through the body out of the top of my head um, it in, it included an orgasm, but it was so much more than an orgasm. It, I mean, it was just immense. And I opened my eyes because I was so shocked. It was so unprecedented. I'd never experienced it. I'd never heard of it. Um, I think I was about 30, 31 at the time. And the Bible that I had closed on my cross legs had somehow fallen open on the Song of Solomon, which is the mystical text of, of the Jewish faith par excellence. Um, and after that, everything changed, Ralph. I was having, uh, things were crawling up my body in the night. 
when I was out in the day and I could barely get out. But when I was out, I could, sounds crazy, but it's like I had no skin. I, I could pick up so much information from people's faces, from trees. I felt as if everything was coming in on me. And I think one of the best things that happened to me at that time, there were two things. I spoke to a specialist in mysticism and asked her, is this orthodox? And she said, yeah. She said, this sounds like a classic Judeo-Christian mystical initiation. Your illness must be an invitation onto the mystical path. This is where she and I might differ, but comes back to what you were saying, right? The framing. Um, and the other really good thing was I saw a Russian Orthodox priest who, when he heard of some of the phenomena I was having, you know, I could literally be ecstatic and then it would turn to terror, then it would turn to ecstasy. And I was I just didn't, it was enormous. And I, I had no way, I had no guide, I had no help, I had no framework. And the priest just said, stop meditating, get your hands in the ground, be around normal humans. And that was, <laughs> it was like the best piece of advice he could have given me. So for years, I gave up meditation and only came back to it much later when I'd learned not to identify with states. And all this time, Ralph, I was chronically ill. All this time I was having the MECFS symptoms. I couldn't cope with light. I couldn't cope with noise. I was having periods where everything was sensory, complete sensory overload. If I did anything, I got post-exertional malaise, which is one of the key symptoms. It's when people do anything at all, then the body just goes, no, and you slams you down. I mean, I was crawling to the toilet, having a pee, going back to bed and crying with pain. I mean, I was in a very, very ill, broken down state. At the same time as this really disorientating, truly frightening level of wonderful, ecstatic, profound, life-changing awakening. So for me, the, the fusion of those things at that time was really powerful and really overwhelming. And, and my life was never the same after that. I mean, why would it be? How could yeah. it be? Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you've, there, there's, a, there's a couple of things that came to mind when you, you're describing that. One thing that's interesting is, given your an evangelical um, stint in, as an evangelical Christian, speaking in tongues and um, you know, like fluttering your eyelids and experiencing the light and all of those kind of things, it sounds like I'm I'm just about to do a, a deep dive into Ian McGilchrist's work, but it, it sounds it sounds like a kind of an orgy of right brain activity, you know? doesn't it? And <laughs> But it's interesting that given that background, th this new experience you had sent you, you know, you didn't, you say you didn't have a reference point for that when you'd clearly had mystical experiences I had, in the evangelical the Christian setting. Yeah, and, and it's a mismatch. It was, it was the fact that the reality tunnel that I'd been in, through which my mysticism was channeled, which was contemplative Christian texts. And, you know, I was reading Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, the mismatch between that framing and the lived experience of what then happened, which was outside that frame, was, I think, what kind of confused me. And it was only something like 25 years later that somebody gave me Stanislav's Grov, Stanislav Grov's book, Spiritual Emergency, or a Spiritual Emergence. Mm. And almost every chapter in that book, I was going, oh, Oh, I see. Yeah. But I now know that what happened was a full on Kundalini awakening. Yeah, that's the other thing I was going to say is that what you're describing, I've heard loads of people describing what they call a Kundalini awakening. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting that it also what is happening in an evangelical context, a lot of that you could interpret that as Kundalini activity and you know, kriyas are these kind of like mm -hmm. uh, in kundalini uh, terminology people kind of spasm spasming and doing weird things with their bodies and i've seen videos of e evangelical um churches and you know that's definitely going on and people making odd noises and it's all it's all you know it's all in that kind of yeah wheelhouse it's just um, not framed that way mm. it's framed as the action of the holy spirit right but because of the, um, in the church I was in, at least, the, you know, people used to talk casually about the great unwashed. 
um, that the non-Christians were the great unwashed and all this, which is language that I think is really unhelpful. I don't, I don't approve <laughs> of it at all. It's language. <laughs> Awful. Um, uh, but there was that whole God and Satan thing, right, in the church. Hmm. So the phenomena that feel alien to the Protestant framing of the evangelical charismatic Christian thing I mean, I, when I turned up at university and met evangelical Christians as a Catholic, I was told I wasn't really a Christian. And this is a very narrow framing, right? Catholicism might be more open in some ways to the mystical than that is this, but this is the Holy Spirit. But it comes with this Protestant work ethic and this very Victorian framing of the brain and the relationship between faith, you know, as facts, faith, then feeling, and faith follows facts. So no matter what you feel, you follow the facts of faith, you know, all this stuff, which is actually looking at it psychologically is quite repressed. And so, you know, when those energies happen with the rolling round in the aisles and all that, there'll be some Christians who go, oh, that's that's not godly. That's that's not from God. For, for others, it's like the action of the Holy Spirit. Um, and it's really interesting to hear all the different multi-layered interpretations that go on e in even that setting. But for me, the Kundalini thing, if people in the church I was in at the time had known about that, they would have said that's demonic. Hmm. They would have said, Anna, that's because you've been doing martial arts. And because you started practicing more Eastern meditation yeah. styles alongside your contemplative Christian practice. That's what I think that, you know, I can't speak for anyone. OK, but this is my my sense of it. And obviously it's only my story. It's only my reality, etc. But my sense of it is that knowing what I knew at the time, that that's what people would have said. And of course, I did fluctuate between ecstasy and terror. Because I had no way of safely relating to that. I had no more expansive framework in which that's normalized. And actually, Ralph, it's really interesting, isn't it, when you think about things like trauma release exercise, which is a modality that we use to release trauma from the body, that's almost identical to Kriya. People get into states, they they writhe, they, you know, and and I find sometimes in meditation that things will just pop up. And I know it's a release of something that's been unconscious i don't even need to know what it is i just know that it's gone it's yeah. been released or, or or cathartically integrated or however you want to frame it doesn't really matter as long as you're moving in the direction of away from a kind of chronicity into a kind of well-being and expansion and peace you know at the end of the day what does it matter it's that kind of fruit of character the ethical development the capacity to love to show up as compassion to be that kind of energy in the world that is the true marker of spirituality in my view so th this this relates to comes this relates to this side the story we're telling about things and and our experiences and i think this demonic element to it although people don't think we live in uh we're talking about people living in the modern western world think we live in a post christian post religious world to so the secular world and i think actually these instinctive feelings of demons and satan and the devil are still actually alive and well in the psycho psyche of a lot of people maybe even most and it doesn't have to be the it doesn't have to be that way and uh speaking from my own experience um i've had uh you know many many years of experience with uh psychedelics and mm -hmm. Um, although not recent, recently, um, and probably not for the for the foreseeable future, <laughs> that it may get into, but I don't know. Um, the so early on, I had experiences that were so overwhelming in 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 a similar way to what you're describing. I like a a bad trip in a way could almost be described that you feel like you're being overwhelmed by some negative for some demonic force something with a negative valence and it's just it's coming from outside you and it's coming in to just ruin the situation and just make it all bad and it's rotten and it's and then i kind of i got into shamanism and animism and stuff and i had some uh, in one time i had uh psilis, this is in my tw early 20s psilocybin mushrooms and syrian rue which is an ayahuasca analog and it's very very potent stuff and i was really into shamanism at the time and i was like 
man, I've offended some spirits and they've come to kick my ass and I was having a really hardcore time and um, and it was terrifying. And then later on, you know, as years went on and I kind of basically became a kind of monist, uh, you know, I, I don't really, I, what I mean by that is that there's only one entity full stop <laughs> you know one being um and so you know when i was having those kinds of experiences it wasn't like oh no you know some really harmful spirits come in and it's it's come to wreak havoc or or the devil's visiting uh it's like oh there okay some really powerful things coming up and from inside the you know well words fail here but you know it's 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 me it's you it's the one being we are that it's not like this is an external thing and that changed everything for me and although i could still have really hardcore experiences that terrified me have not having to deal with the story of like oh this is these are spirits or this is the devil get you know really lighten the load i've got to say you know yeah. it's like that adds a whole nother layer onto it and again it's a little bit of a diversion but I, it, for me that was a really important transition um yeah. that makes so much sense ralph and 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 it's although it's a, you can think of it as a diversion it's actually just kind of a richer thread because coming back to chronic fatigue syndrome and how people relate to themselves in illness of course very often the unconscious things that are being repressed are precisely being repressed because they're dreaded experiences in the self. So what overwhelms me as a baby, if I revisit that at the age of 45, can still feel overwhelming in the body, even though as a 45-year-old adult, I might be able to rationalise it. But being, being able to be comfortable with those levels of discomfort coming through and moving out it's very analogous to what you've just been saying about the way that you expanded to understand that these forces and energies were actually kind of intrinsically part of you, not some external malignant something that was attacking some you. And I think that's that's really key. And, you know, we see it all the time, don't we, psychologically, when people project onto other people their experience as if that other person is doing this to me. When in fact, actually, we're projecting our own psychological frameworks onto other people and making them carry what we will not allow because it's too uncomfortable to face that this this is coming up in our shadow, you know. So I think, although you say it was um, kind of a long, it's a, I think it's a beautiful alongside and a, a a thread that weaves into all of this. And coming back to the demonic, I was really struck when I've got I've got a good friend who's a burn practitioner, Buddhist burn practitioner. And in her tradition, they love demons. So when a demon comes up, they seek to welcome it and integrate it. They don't expel it. Um, and years after being in the church where we were experts in expelling demons, I read a, a book on the demonic and psychiatry. It was a very interesting book. And I came to believe that actually what people experience is the outside entity that's being expelled is in fact a shard or a facet of self that has been cathartically reintegrated, even though it's not being thought of in that type of way, it's not being framed in that way, but it is a catharsis that allows an integration, perhaps even an unconscious integration of a previously fragmented, alienated, disowned part of the self. So all this comes together, I think, in a really interesting way. Mm. So the, the other thing you, you mentioned was stopping um two times so you said initially you, you i mean it, it sounds like you were you were quite an overachiever perhaps oh, yes, you, right, yeah okay yeah. <laughs> damn um, you got yeah. me and, <laughs> so you know that that's the first time it came up was like uh often people are in those situations and uh if you're an overachiever in life the messages are coming saying stop mm -hmm. um, and you know just bringing it back to the psychedelics for me recently i had i was 
I've been overdoing it. Um, and <laughs> I was, uh, and it was like, I need to stop this because uh, I'm poss could go mad. Yeah. Um, so I was like, yeah, I really don't want to go mad. I'm going to stop. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that with cr with chronic fatigue, so there are things you can do to to just not get chronic fatigue. Let's not get chronic fatigue in the first place. Yeah. So perhaps we could address that. But then the other thing was you're having these experiences, these mystical experiences, and you've got this great advice to say, just stop meditating. Yeah. Like do some normal stuff. Yeah. And when people have a very strong spiritual impulse, you don't want to do that. You want to break it open. You want to keep, you know, just like get to the end or do, or just blow the, the lid open on this thing and, you know, just all of that stuff. And, uh, and, and I'm speaking from experience, uh, but over the years, I've become a little bit wiser about it. And that's it. so if I'd had this experience where I was going mad uh, 20 years ago, I'd been like, cool, I'm going mad. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah, I can be a, a sharp, you know, a mad shaman or you know, one of these mad yogis. I'll just go and live on a loincloth somewhere and it'd be great. But not really uh, when you when you actually encounter that. And so there's the, the two types of stopping, but perhaps you could address weave that into one response or two separate ones. I'll do what I can, but yeah. I'm, I'm, I think what you're putting your finger on there is something really, really important. Um, I've come to believe over time and experience and working with others that unless you have a well-developed ego in the Freudian sense, there is a real risk with spiritual experiences that you can go into psychosis and completely lose yourself. So I think there is something here about health and it ties together with the chronic fatigue stuff as well, because I actually also have experienced that the healthier my body is, the more I can metabolize these powerful energies, these powerful states. And I think one of the issues for me was when I first had the Kundalini awakening and was so ill and all that, is my body was super fit, but not healthy. <laughs> and, you know, I was, I was, you know, pulling myself up ropes with just my hands doing martial arts three times a week. I was, a, I was a real badass at that, but I didn't have a balanced physiology and my, the total allostatic load on my body was too much. Um, and like a lot of that, you know, it's one of the reasons why so many athletes can end up with chronic fatigue because they, you know, they overtrain. Yeah. And so I, they, I just want to just, sorry, just to interrupt there. Sport. people think of sport as a health activity. Mm. I, 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 there's a guy called Steve Maxwell who I got really into his stuff. Um, he said something that was really useful for me. Sport is not a path of health. Mm, I agree. Health is not so. Sport, you get injuries, you burn out, you overexert yourself. I know there's nothing wrong with doing sport, but you know that's a if you that's what you're into, um, you know, then that's fine. Uh, but if you want to be healthy. This is exactly what you're saying. That's a different thing. You it know? is. And, and, you and we, can end, we, can, we can end up following sports gurus in, a bit, in, a, in an attempt to become more healthy. It's quite popular, you know, with the people, all the influencers and stuff. Some yeah. of those people are into sports. And um, if you want to get healthy, it's a different thing. And I think you're about to get into that. But I just wanted to flag that because for me, it was like a penny dropped because I've been I've been injuring myself doing sports activities. Right. Um, <laughs> I got into gymnastic rings oh, right. uh, okay. as, as, a, as a, a health and fitness activity. But actually, I was entering the domain of sport and I injured myself. I was an idiot. I didn't listen. I overexerted myself and I but had to take eight months off all physical activity as a result mm. of it. Uh, and I've, and, and I've got a permanently damaged shoulder. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, it's quite a, it was quite a sore recognition for me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a key point. And uh, there's a kind of golden zone, right? We, we do need beneficial stress called mesis. We need that to evolve the body. If, I, if I'm not asking my body for more energy, it's not going to produce more energy. If I lie around all day, I'm actually going to decondition myself. And, you know, we can get into the, all the health optimization sciences much as you want. But the basic principle is you do need to be 
you know, to, to move, you need to live well by moving well, eating well, thinking well, and, you know, taking good care of yourself. And we, you know, where we started on this was the whole relationship between bodily well-being and spiritual evolution and psychological well-being and spiritual evolution. And I think they're inseparable. I think that a truly balanced, integrative approach to all of this sees that we are one complex emergent system with all these different dynamics in interplay and that the skill of being human is about learning what foundational practices give rise to well-being and all these levels and attending to that dance and being flexible and generative and wise and self-loving in that dance um, and I'm 100% behind you with the sports thing. I mean, the sports are great. And I used to be really sporty. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to go back to martial arts if I was, you know, fit enough, as long as I could guarantee not getting injured. Because I'm 64. I don't want some 23 year old smacking me on a mat and breaking my ribs, you know, because it'll take me longer to recover now. But but there's just something gleefully, beautifully liberating about being able to use your body in skillful ways. And um, I've been learning recently a lot about muscle centric health. You know, building muscle is critical. It's not it, it's not just aesthetic. It's linked to hormonal balance. It's linked to immune function. It's linked to resilience, particularly as you get older. A lot of people who end up in care homes, if they haven't got dementia, it's because they've got sarcopenia. Their muscles have, you know, and so they've been fragilized. And, and we don't have to accept any of that. You know, we don't have to accept that. We can reverse that. And we're. this is where the plasticity comes in. We can, you know, really become very healthy at any, at any age or stage. But we can't do it instantly and we can't necessarily do it by pushing. That there, there is this fundamental praxis of wisdom, which is where we have to stay within a hormetic envelope. We have to know that what we're asking of the body is beneficial asking not the kind of asking that you were doing by when you pressed through on the rings, knowing that you were pushing it, you know, then you went outside your hermetic window and you had kind of negative stress. And that's what a lot of sport does. And it, as you say, I, did you use the word macho? I can't remember. You, I think you did it one time. It was earlier, wasn't it? It was in relation to how we think yeah. about the body. But there is something there about a kind of, you know, it's a bit trite to say masculinist, but, you know, it has been traditionally a masculinist mode of relating to the body, just pushing through. And that's very much where I was before I got before I got ill, um, pushing my body because I was brought up by a soldier who basically said, develop a spine. If your body screams, keep going. Well, that's how the military train. Right. Um, but look how a lot of them end up. Yeah. So the, we got to. Th you're 30. Uh, yeah you're now 64 so we've got this there's there's Love another the <laughs> there's another 34 years to this uh story this okay this okay learning so, curve yeah this learning curve so yeah so um i've got to try and remember it all ralph it's so long ago but um mm. basically i left my marriage which was a hugely important moment in terms of reducing relational stress probably for him as well bless him but that needed to happen um, and then I spent a number of years being on and off a bed, gradually getting better, sometimes getting worse, trained, went back to restudy law, which was kind of an important moment for me. I did it part time. I limped along and then I got my first academic job at Oxford Brooks University way back in the day um, and went into academic life and kind of managed to inch my way up, had another big relapse in about 2000 and four or so had another year of not being able to work revisitation of some earlier levels of debility but with a much much better understanding that was my first introduction to anything vaguely health optimization I went on something called the anti-candida diet um, I also moved to live by the sea which when I went down to see the sea, this is when I came down to Bridport, right? When I moved down to, when I came down to Bridport one day to kind of check it out, I now understand this, this is a really powerful hypnotic somatic metaphor, but I sat, sat on the beach having spent most of the year pretty much in a room. And every time I left the room, it would just be to go to an ex-partner's house or back into a room. It was very limited life. The enormity of the Jurassic Coast, that 26, 27 miles that you can see from that beach in Bridport, um, 
by the cliff, that did something to my body. It, it actually kind of switched some sense, some embodied somatic sense of, wow, life can be bigger. There can be a new expansion. And I think moving down to the sea and having the CO zones and all the rest was really, really helpful. Um, and the sort of spiritual practice was going on all the time alongside that. I got into some spiritual tech. So the Holosync meditation program, Mind Lab Orion kits with the I, kind I of did Holosync for a few years, but probably yeah. six years actually. Yeah, me too. I got I I'm sort of right up in the top one now, kind of drifting around, occasionally thinking, do I need this? <laughs> but anyway, um, and the kind of mind lab Orion, which was like psychedelic colours, and I could pick brain where I was basically into um hacking, biohacking at this stage. Um, not full on biohacking, but certainly brain hacking for performance, for framing. And I taught law students, so I was teaching them brain hacking skills and all that. So I was passionate about that. And then got as far as getting to Cardiff Uni, took on head of law. It was very badly organized there and lasted nine months. And my whole system basically collapsed again. And I had to accept I was back in relapse. So this is like seven years ago. And have bumped along ever since until recently I've left Cardiff and I'm now going full time as a kind of, I don't know how to describe it really, an integrative synaptic change worker, stroke hypnotist, stroke whatever, but I work with people with fatigue and also people who feel they're going in, in danger of going into fatigue. Increasingly, I want to work with people in that capacity because why wait till they've fallen over the cliff? You know, why not get them before? Mm. So that kind of brings it up to date. And, and and alongside all of that, of course, the spiritual expansion has just gone on and on and on and on um, and seems to be intensifying it, intensifying rates of intensification, um, which is all rather gorgeous. But but of course, I don't identify with it in the way that I did back then. So now it's just pretty much blissful. There's very little terror. And if terror comes up in meditation, there's a kind of blissful expansiveness in which it emerges and moves through and it, it just feels deeply safe and of course I've done you know very deep years and years of psychotherapeutic work to lay to rest some of that early life material and all the rest of it and it's great being a hypnotist because I have loads of hypnotist friends so I can just say hey can we have a sesh <laughs> and we give each other stuff and that's almost magical so that's me now I've done it very potted but yeah that is and you uh for anyone listening who wants to hear a more detailed version you did a podcast interview I think it's on your fatigue files it is yeah but, uh, you had someone interview you about that yeah yeah she asked again. to interview me and that's where we went it's called the breaking of the shell yeah and so I'd recommend anyone listen to that for the for the extended version <laughs> um yeah so how terrifying to have to take a year off work a couple of times or three times mm. or how many times you've had to do it. I mean that, and I want to add that you had, you have children, you know, yeah, through, through all of this and yeah, it was hard for them. Yeah. Really, the pit, it's really hard for them. Yeah. Awful for them. Yeah. I, that's one of the things I still feel really sad about actually, Ralph, that one of my greatest regrets about all of it, even though like, I don't feel ungrateful for what I've learned my greatest regret is that I couldn't be the mother I aspired to be, you know, in terms of just being able to run around with them, play with them, relate to them from a different place. And, and when I was first ill, I think they thought I was dying because my dad had recently died and they were allowed in the room for like 20 minutes to talk, talk to me. That was all I could cope with. And that does very deep things in the lives of children, you know, and my kids are amazing. They're in their thirties. They're emotionally gifted, thoughtful, sensitive, you know, really working on their own journeys and all that. I'm just so proud of them, but I kind of feel that I can take no credit for it whatsoever because I feel like I was part of what set them up for a very difficult journey. I was, I was Carly, yeah. <laughs> Un unwittingly. Yeah. Well, they got a very wise and compassionate mum nowadays. And um, so you know what perhaps we could we could transition into what what you know you've indicated some of them but you've uh, done a lot of experimentation with methods to keep your life on track and ke keep you from crawling to the toilet in the bed but in between the toilet and the bed i mean yes yeah, so it's it, it it that that is such a narrow 
uh, life. And, and, and that, I think it's a really good way of describing it. Literally, you crawling from the bed to the toilet yeah. and back. Yeah. You know, it's, it just show, it illustrates what a narrow uh, life it is. It can be. Yeah. Yeah. And how debilitating it was, because don't forget before that, I was performing high level martial arts three yeah. times a week. Yeah. I loved bodily life. Like I always enjoyed sex. I always enjoyed food. I always enjoyed being energetic, athletic. So the contrast yeah. is really telling. This is not someone who was always a bit of a kind of lie on the couch kind of girl who yeah. ended up crawling to the yeah. toilet. Yeah, which well, just makes it all the it's all the more extreme. And and that uh, and I can only you know I can imagine what that would do to your soul. You know. Mm. It was hard, Ralph. There's no way around it. It was yeah. a very, very hard path. But, you know, I, I wouldn't change it. If, if if I could have got where I've got without it, great, brilliant. I'd love that. And I think yeah. people can. You know, as we've said before, you don't have to suffer to grow. But the fact is, I can't resent it because it was my path, has been my path. Um, so that's a paradox, but that's kind of how I feel. So perhaps we, we could address that towards the end of like how to prevent chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah. If you can feel yeah. if you can feel the tug in that direction. Um, so, you know, you, you, I imagine you've tried. Let's say two uh, out of 200 things you've tried, 30 might have stayed mm -hmm. uh, for the long for the long run. Yeah. So, you know, what what are these? core practices that you have uh, whittled down from all the things you've tried okay if i had to sum it up in one little phrase it would be coming home to self and by that i mean coming home to the body and the body's multiple intelligences coming home to the foundations of a healthy psyche coming home to a grounded authentic flexible spirituality but the actual practices so obviously for me the psychotherapeutic work has been a huge strand of my healing because I had so much mess to deal with from my early life which I haven't got into but it was very difficult um, that was a huge strand in it but physiologically which I suspect is what most people will be interested in it comes down to returning to evolutionary imperatives in the body so certain core practices, starting with circadian efficiency, like you can sleep for eight hours and think you've had a good sleep, but you won't necessarily have had a good sleep if your sleep isn't truly efficient. So <clears throat> there are certain practices that I learned. I've got a list of about 20 things that I do that are all around circadian hygiene. But, you know, key is the fact that our cellular structures, which are way older than us in evolutionary terms, evolved in night and day evolved responding to light and the, and for you know thousands of years humans before the industrial Re revolution would have in the evening the red waves sp light spectrum of the setting sun or fires in caves or outside when the industrial revolution came in more you know in modern homes we have ridiculous lights on we watch screens with blue light and everything else and those send signals to receptors in the brain that evolved to pick up signals from light that then mean that adenosine which is a, a hormone in the brain that we need for sleep pressure and melatonin is suppressed in its production which means that you're not going to get clean sleep now people can go yeah well if i don't get a good night's sleep next day i'm cranky well, there's so much more to it than that because the body on this 24-hour cycle of circadian health is doing multitudes of functions at a cellular level so every night we need something called autophagy we need cells that are getting old or senescent to be killed off in the body well you don't get efficient autophagy if you don't have good circadian efficiency you don't get good mitophagy which is where the mitochondria which are like the little energy production units in the cells but they're so much more than that they're sensing organisms they're constantly going safe dangerous safe dangerous and we can get into that there's so much there with mitochondria highly intelligent but 
you don't get mitophagy. So you, you don't get this, the die off there that you need. You don't get glymphatic cleaning where the glim, there's a, something called the glymphatic system in the brain that kind of cleans out all the proteins that the brain no longer needs. So disrupted early sleep in particular is linked with dementia and Alzheimer's. So, you know, there, there are so many critical functions at the cellular level that rely on good circadian discipline. So the first thing I always check with clients is what is their circadian hygiene like? Are they wearing proper, and I mean proper, red light glasses that block blue and green light spectrums that, that are wraparound so you're not getting light in the side? Um, are they doing that two hours before bed every night so that by the time they get into bed, the brain is ready to do what the brain needs to do to send out all the kind of neuromodulators, hormones and all the rest of it to the whole system so that all the organs, which after all rely on cellular patterns for their well-being, are adequately cared for in that circadian hygiene. Are they having a clean start to the day? Are they looking at the rising sun or out in wavelengths where the sun is rising in the sky this is how we evolved right in the evening are they watching sunset so that they get the brain gets the signal of the changing light waves from you know our connection with the earth we are earthlings through and through and one of the things that this illness teaches you is that you know embodied materiality matters and is intelligently linked to the materiality of everything else right I'm a big fan of new materialist philosophy, which we, we don't have to get into, but basically it's about the intelli intelligence of materialization itself. And, you know, all the kind of health optimization science increasingly points to how we need to reverse certain things that modern living and modern thinking about the body has produced. So we've got an epidemic of chronic illness, an absolute epidemic of chronicity. Light exposure in the evening is linked to obesity because it changes the leptin cycle. So, you know, people can be trying to lose weight with their diet and we can talk about that. But if they're, if they're getting shit light at night, if they've got junk light and they're not getting proper light signals through the 24 hour cycle, sleeping in complete darkness, which independently of light exposure has been shown to have powerful health benefits. If they're not doing all those things, they're going to struggle to lose the, lose the fat because the system is inefficient. It's not getting what it needs as one of its key energy and signaling inputs, which is light and dark. Um, at one level, it's very simple because you're returning to evolutionary imperatives, but it's not so simple when you live in a 21st century capitalist society, which is why you have to start thinking about turning lights off, getting different bulbs, you know, putting red light glasses on to replicate as best you can those older evolutionary Pattern. So that's one way of avoiding fatigue for anyone, for any human body. You know, fatigue is is always a sign of an underlying pathology. You know, proper fatigue is always a sign of an underlying pathology. It might not lead to chronic fatigue, but it might be a signal of some autoimmune dysfunction that's arriving or some potential cancer. Like you know, this, the way it links to all these forms of chronicity is really powerful. So sleep, circadian hygiene, absolutely key. That involves nutrient timing, like not eating. I don't eat three hours before my bedtime. I finish eating by six every night. Why? Because I want to have that long overnight fast. I want at least 12 to 14 hours, sometimes a bit more, where my system can just clean itself out with all the functions of overnight and getting that cellular autophagy. Um, exercise timing. I don't want to be stimulating my body um, in the evening my body needs to calm down so if I'm going to do a physical workout which I aim to do every day I'm going to do that either in the morning or about three or four in the afternoon five at the latest because I don't want to disrupt my sleep pattern caffeine I won't have caffeine after three in the afternoon if I'm going to nap I won't nap after three in the afternoon because it reduces sleep pressure I mean there's a whole list of things and I've forgotten loads of them um, but like one thing is this sharp start to the day. So that's light. If, if you can't get sunlight, which in Britain at this time of year, we can't. You want a 10,000 lux light that you look at or have by you very close to you for half an hour. Um, you want to get up and move. Movement is um, what they call a zeitgeber, um, a signal, a circadian signal. So getting up, moving, stretching, having a cold shower first thing. Excellent for circadian hygiene. 
quite hardcore, but excellent for circadian hygiene. Then the evening, you want the opposite. You want a slow wind down so that you're running into the evening, calming the whole thing right down, minimal inputs, you know. Um, so you, you also have um, saunas. I do. Regular I have a, saunas. Yeah. I do. This is about detoxification, about cardiovascular health. I just uh, ask about the time of day you do, because yeah. I... I've got an infrared sauna, um, which is such an easy thing to have in a house. I mean, I got mine secondhand really cheap on, mm. um, and it's just, you flick a switch and it's just that it's so, it's so simple, but I found if I have, if I do that after 5 PM, say, uh, I'm wired when I go to bed, I'm, mm. I'm not ready for sleep. Um, yeah. I tend not to do it in the evening. Mm. Um, some people do. I know I know people who are into health optimization practices who do, and then they'll have a really cold shower straight after. Right. Because when you go when you're approaching bed, you want to be cooling down. Mm. So you want your bedroom to be cold. Um, I think the ideal temperature they say is around 15 degrees, 14.5 to 15 degrees. I like mine a bit cooler than that. I mean, you experiment, right? But I tend to have my saunas in the morning. So I tend to get up, walk the dog really early. And then I'm straight into the infrared sauna, then into a cold shower, then in front of an infrared light panel for 20 minutes and a UVB panel to stimulate vitamin D. Um, somewhere in that, I usually do a workout. And if I don't do a workout in the morning, I'll do a workout in the afternoon. Um, and that'll be like resistance band training or whatever, because you want to get you obviously want to build muscle. So that's resistance training. You want the endurance training, the zone two cardio training. And the bit where I'm weaker is on the cardiovascular high intensity work, which is more problematic if you've got chronic fatigue. That's where you can get it wrong and trigger problems. But the yeah. sauna, of course, as you know, Ralph, pushes your cardiovascular system anyway. Um, and I think there's something like a 40 percent reduction in cardiovascular incidents in people who regularly sauna three or five times a week. I'm more of a kind of seven days a week girl. I don't know about you, but um and of course, the sweating is fantastic for detoxification. Um, and they've measured the sweat of people coming out of saunas and found PCBs and heavy metals and all sorts of stuff being sweated out because the fat stores the toxins. So I wouldn't recommend anyone to start losing fat without having a sauna. And I wouldn't recommend having a sauna without taking some activated charcoal about 20 minutes before or after so that you're soaking up whatever's released because whatever's released out of the fat storage you don't want it coming up to the brain so, so um but saunas are fantastic i'm glad you've got one yeah that uh, uh, I, I i love it so you know one thing that's coming to mind is people hear this and they're they're like so anna lives on her own simple life you yeah. know stripped down so she's got loads of time to develop uh, to, to dedicate to these things um, I mean, I know you you work <clears throat> just as hard as anyone else in your job. Um, but because you live on your own, you've got the time at the beginning, end of the day or whatever, or middle to, to slide these practices in. And, you know, there is something to be said where when people I've heard the response when people say when they're talking about meditating or exercise or something like that people say oh i haven't got time to meditate or work out and then the people that work out and meditate they say i haven't got time to not do that you know it's just it contributes so much to you know i feel like i meditate every day um i have uh, sleep hygiene practices and you know i work out and and those kind of things and if I don't do those things, everything starts to fall apart. Yeah, it will do. Like, yeah. And um, so it's it's making that kind of putting your feelings aside about your fears or discomforts about contemplating a life filled with so many beneficial activities. It's kind of a funny thing, but um, <clears throat> you're taking a really objective like a kind of cold rational view of like cost to benefit mm -hmm. analysis of it actually 
if you want if you really want to do something because you're desperate for results you can you will make time to do anything really you know it's uh within certain you know obvious limits but i can i can imagine some people listening to this and and thinking how would i ever fit in yeah, absolutely daily it's, saunas yeah. putting on these lights sitting in front of different lights cold showers and i know you also eat uh m predominantly organic food and yeah those kind of things and then people might worry about the expense of eating yeah. organic food and then <clears throat> i imagine you eat mainly whole foods too so it's that means preparing food not getting um takeaways or, or um, processed foods and pre-made stuff which is all designed for convenience and time and time efficiency mm -hmm. so you know it's it's, it's Perhaps we could address you. You could address that that of, of people listening to this and thinking, "All oh, right, you know, Anna can do this, but what what am I going to do with my four kids and got to pick them up yeah. from school and I and I and I'm always worrying about money and um, yeah. all of those sort of things." How how would you address that? Well, I think it's a difficult one because I think the structural condition. This is where we get into this meta structure of fatigue because you know the structural conditions in which we live are antibody and a lot of the food you describe the pre-prepared food isn't actually food it's got very poor nutrient quality um, and we live in a system where we've got an industrialized food system a massive pharmaceutical industry where the medical paradigm is if you're ill let's smash the symptoms let's suppress the symptoms so the body's going to produce a different symptom because the body's communicating it's intelligent you're muffling it in one area is going to produce something elsewhere. And that's often what you see. Um, and then you get drug interactions. And then before you know it, you've got people with all sorts of problems. And the average American, I think, is on 15 drugs a day, apparently. I mean, it's just appalling. So I think we have to step back and say, actually, I need to find a way to resist these systemic pressures. And the first place to start is, have I got an internalized capitalist ethic? Have I internalized the drivenness of the system. That's the first place to challenge it because actually some of these interventions are very simple. If you haven't got a sauna, wear more jumpers and go out for a sweaty walk on the way to the bus stop and then, you know, just kind of deal with a bit of discomfort when you get to work or choose to run up and down the stairs or get get something where you can exercise at your desk. Like there are ways of doing this if you if you want to i mean when i when i first started all of this i was a very busy academic holding down a job that worked i worked far more than 40 hours a week as an academic if i hadn't been doing these practices by getting up early to do them and starting the day with that i wouldn't have been able to do my academic work as efficiently as i did i think it's more challenging when you've got kiddies i think that is much more challenging because it's not like you've got just workload that you can kind of manage somehow as an adult and negotiate with another adult look this is how I live you know this is can we eat early or whatever you negotiate with a partner or whoever you're living with with children I think it's more difficult but you can make the kids part of it as well because actually um, Ari Witten who's a guy I really respect in this field points out that there are some very low cost ways of doing this you know circadian hygiene doesn't have to be flash you know, you can, the, the red light glasses cost, what, 80 quid? Like, if you just did that and got up and had a cold shower and made sure that you looked at the daylight in the evening, watched the sunset, you're already way ahead of quite a lot of people. And I always say to people, do what you can when you can, you know, and add in the layers. And this is where it gets more complex, Ralph, because we mentioned circadian hygiene. There's diet, there's water for purification, there's the quality of the air we breathe. There's the quality of our internal relationship with ourselves. There's the nervous system stuff. You know, are we constantly stressed? If you're constantly stressed, you're in low grade fight or flight all the time. That is not how the body evolved to function. We're actually meant to be parasympathetic unless there's a reason for sympathetic response, like a tiger jumps out or we need to produce a performance for some reason. But then we need that. But, but most moderns, 
live with a persistent sense of underlying stress, that kind of worm in the stomach that's always saying, you haven't done it, you haven't done this, you haven't done that. And we're always, forget I mean, I don't know about you, Ralph, but I often forget things I need to do, even urgent things, I forget them because, you know, on top of all this, we've got the pressure of thinking about climate change, we've got situation in Gaza, you know, we've got speculation about what that means for the kind of geopolitical map, all that stuff means that people are very stressed and pressed. And so this is a kind of slow activism. Like this is a kind of way of saying, right, I'm going to live against the system, no matter how simply at first I have to do it. Because there's a reason why so many people are getting chronically ill. And I was one of those people that was like, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. Rush, rush. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. Well, sure do that but one day your body's going to shout at you if you're not listening when it's whispering it's going to scream one day and then you won't have any choice right i i had no choice at all when when my body collapsed i had no agency other than how do i relate to this thing that's just happened to me now that was the only agency i had and as you pointed out ralph my world became incredibly small my my capacities were so diminished now if i'd known then what i know now i would have said to myself don't be ridiculous you can get up an hour earlier you can get up and you know do your meditation and your go out for a run before the kids are up i would have actually had that little conversation with myself <laughs> instead of being the slightly chaotic highly driven overperforming mess that i was um, so that's what I'd say. And I, my heart goes out to people. There are very low cost ways of doing this. Like you can wash your non-organic food as best you can. It's suboptimal, but there are, you know, there are kind of things you can buy to rinse your food for 20 minutes before you eat it. Preparing food from scratch doesn't have to take forever. It's not actually that difficult. I mean, one thing I've learned to do is to eat my dinner at breakfast so I'll have a cooked meal or a large salad with meat for breakfast and then a, hardly any lunch and then I'll have a, a supper. Um, and that, following the kind of dietary principles I follow, has changed my body composition. I've got more muscle. I've lost fat. Um, I've got more energy. And that's not time consuming. And I did go through a period before I got ill of having convenience foods because I thought it took too much time to cook. So I was the microwave queen, I was eating absolute low nutrition nonsense that now I look at and I think that's not food, it's a toxin delivery system. And, you know, I might be controversial on this point. People might get fed up hearing this, but honestly, that's what I've learned. So we have to get back. You know, if it hasn't grown in the ground or eaten something that's grown in the ground, then probably don't eat it. Yeah. <clears throat> so the simple way to look at all of this is that uh, na nature is your guide in this and the evolutionary past of humans is it's imagining what the life of wild humans was. Um, yeah, to a degree, although yeah. I am a health optimization science junkie and there are definite there are definite research breakthroughs that go beyond that to optimization of human function. Yeah. So, can, so we, can we get into some of those? Yeah, sure. I mean, the latest discovery for me, and I did do it a while ago and then have just re recently rediscovered it, is hydrogen water. Like you can buy hydrogen tablets that you pop in your water and you drink it straight away. Hydrogen water, something like a thousand papers showing all the benefits. And I've been, I bought one of those jugs that makes, you know, adds hydrogen to the water. I've noticed how much clearer my brain is, how much more energy I've got, um, quite extraordinary. And then of course, you know, you've got all the research around infrared light, you know, while, while you can say at one level, we're replicating something evolutionary because we're giving, you know, photonic energy into the cells, it's science and health optimization science and the research that's enabled us to do that with infrared and to actually understand what infrared wavelengths do to the body. So those sort of things. And then, of course, you've got um, stuff like the the tech that, that stimulates the vagus nerve. So there's quite a lot of technology. There's something called Apollo Neuro, 
which you can wear on your wrist or your ankle, which sends sonic signals into the body, stimulates vagal tone, which improves the whole nervous system function and can help people who are wired and tired all the time come down into a really steady parasympathetic state, which in turn releases more physical energy because, you know, if you're stressed, you're operating at a certain level, you're actually not getting the benefit of that relaxed energy. There's something called ammo fit, which you can wear around your neck, which electro stimulates the, the vagus nerve. There are various forms of tech. And then of course, there's the stuff that you know already, the Holosync and the kind of Mind Lab Orion type stuff. I think they've got one called Proteus now, which is lights that flash and you can pick whichever brainwave length you want to stimulate. And you can use brainwave manipulation to manipulate states in the body. And then they're very simple things, Ralph, like self-directed neuroplasticity hacks, which I teach my clients. So like if you're tense, you can do this. It's beautiful. You're looking at me. I'm looking at you. And then just expand your peripheral field so that you're just aware of your peripheral field. Even as you're gazing at me, I'm talking to you, but I'm fully aware of my peripheral field. And then if you sit with that, you'll notice that your body starts to calm. And that your mind also settles. Can you feel that? Yeah. That's an instant nervous system hack. And they teach that to first responders. I heard of someone who learned to do that, who was a self-harmer. She'd had years of psychiatry and psychology. She learned that one hack and she had an overwhelming urge to harm herself, went peripheral, shifted out, shut up, didn't harm herself for the first time in years. There are some very, very powerful, very, very simple hacks that we can learn. And I teach my clients these all the time, a whole bunch of them, so that they can take conscious agency in managing their unconscious processes. So there's loads, Ralph, there's loads. And we're infinitely plastic and we have so many possibilities for healing, for the, the whole system is always wanting to come back to homeostasis. And the thing I would say about people who are getting fatigued is they've got too much allostatic load there's just too much coming from too many angles and so allowing the body to come back to homeostasis by trusting the body's intelligence and working intelligently with the science of the body the science of the mind and how we can work with ourselves is the way forward and i truly believe that people with chronic fatigue are canaries in the mind for wider society and also that people with chronic fatigue who are doing this deep, deep inner work and really evolving spiritually are contributing to the collective shift in consciousness that we so desperately need. When you think about projects like the HeartMath Project and the Global Coherence Initiative and things like that, we know that we're all interconnected, right? As you said, there's one being. like this. So we're all interconnected. So if even if I'm really ill in a bed, if I'm coming into heart-brain coherence and if I'm meditating and i'm sending blissful beneficial intention into the field i am contributing and that's really important to know because if you're really ill you can feel like the world's left you behind that you've got no purpose you've got no role but actually this community people with chronic fatigue they're doing something extraordinary many of them yeah when so when you mentioned the community uh what are some of the chronic fatigue communities uh online or whatever that you've come across that you might direct people to well there are various ones but i run one called hypnocatalyst neurocalm community um and we're about to do a heart coherence group meditation where we just sit in healing energies um but we have it's a beautiful vibe in that community and we meet for something that i call neuro sanger which is where we sit with a kind of guided meditation but they always begin with um, sensitivity to somatic presencing and, and begin with the body and they're very trauma aware. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to be biased and say that's one of the best communities because it's mine. <laughs> but there are others and there's um, there's a program called the Energy Blueprint Program, which is an extraordinary health optimization program. Highly recommend that. There's a guy called Dr. Evan Hirsch who works with fatigue in a really really ordered way See, he says there's something like 30 different causes that he looks at and when he talks about causes it's layers of causes so that you know, it's much more complex but he but that will take quite a bit of time to work through that and 
get the benefits. Um, and then there are loads of kind of ME groups, CFS groups. Some of them are really good in the sense that they, they share people's recovery stories, but that can also be a challenge because a lot of people I work with have been around the recovery stories. They've they've done mind brain retraining programs and they still haven't got the results that they were told they would get if they only use the technique and all of that. And to my mind, that's because there's insufficient appreciation sometimes of the complexity of it as insufficient taking seriously all the layers which have to be taken seriously. And of course, for some people, a one size fits all solution will work depending why they're ill. But for many people, it won't work. And yeah. so, you know, I guess that's my message that it's more complex and that we need to get back to these foundational practices of fundamental human well-being that any human being would be well advised to practice. So you at the beginning of our conversation, you're indicating there's lots of routes into chronic fatigue. Yeah. Um, whether it's viral, um, you know, uh, overachiever lifestyle, environmental toxins, you know, all, all, uh, all of these kind of things. Uh, so there's, by that logic, there'd be many different ways out of it. Too. Yeah. Uh, there's some right. common themes, but, you know, one of the themes of this podcast is that it's, it's not about the one size fits all or the one method um there's, there's yeah. loads of different ways of doing all of these loads. things we're all unique and yeah absolutely but 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 to add to that and i think this is really important ralph you can know that and still be chasing solution after solution after solution and miss the big picture it's about layering in bit by bit all the basics that the system needs as a complex system to flourish and the tipping points might not be predictable it's non-linear right it's a non-linear assemblage of multiple intelligences. And so it's really important to understand the need to get back to those basics, which is where I return to the evolutionary biology point and the foundations of well-being. Because a lot of people know it's complex, but they'll try, oh, I'm going to do high dose vitamin D, and then they don't see results in three months. So they, they jump onto the next thing, then they jump onto the next thing. And I did that for years and years and years. I tried so many alternative therapies. Yeah, I tried so many different things, but I didn't have that big picture. I didn't really, I was just stabbing in the dark in this kind of desperate need to recover. And that itself is counterproductive, which is why I talk about healing, not recovery. Because healing and health is a life journey. Health is a lifelong practice. It's not something you either have or don't have. It's not a binary on or off thing. It's about a relationship with the world, with self, with the body, with all these dimensions of being that is a life practice. And recovery, if you're constantly chasing recovery, hypnotically, you're saying to yourself that you haven't got it, that you're not well, there's something beyond that you're always trying to grasp. Well, that's a very different energy and a very different position, a very different reality tunnel from I'm going to ground myself here and open to the intelligence of exactly what's here and who I already am. And that's a very different journey. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you made those distinctions that um, there's there's always core principles in any field, um, which are the tried and tested ancient uh, principles. And then, uh, you know, you can sprinkle a little bit of uh, these kind of modern newer thing like high dose vitamin d or whatever you know that might work for somebody but get the get the foundations in place mm. and as you say this non-linear the tipping point will come at some point and you can't predict when that is but you just gotta if you layer in enough of these uh core practices at some point something's gonna happen absolutely you just you just keep laying them in and um yeah that's that's, that's to, really and good. You have to keep doing them. It has to be a life commitment. It's a journey, right? If I stop these practices, Ralph, as you implied earlier, if I stop these practices and I start doing the things that I was doing before I became so ill, guess what's going to happen? Yeah. It's not like I'm going to get to some golden point of resilience where nothing touches me because that's not what a human body is. It's an open system. Okay, it's you know, it's it's porous, it's membranous, it's got its own integrity, but it's interwoven as an environmental aspect of a wider entanglement of which we're all a part and which of which we're made of these multiple trillions and trillions of cellular activities 
You know, we're not just one thing. And it, that ties so strongly again with the thing about spirituality that we're talking about, about the self being such a kind of mobile, illusory kind of thing at a certain level. We're always in movement. We are dynamic. We're always becoming. And the real question is, in which direction are we becoming? Hmm. Yeah, that's great, Anna. Really nuanced, wise, um, direct advice um from from your experience and a wonderful thing to share with people and uh so just i think probably people have got the idea by now but it you some people will have a choice at the beginning whether to chronic fatigue is going to be part of their life or not Mm. Uh, you know they can realize the warning signs early on um you know we're running out of time a bit but you know is there anything that you would add to that let's say someone can feel the edges of this you know they can, they're sensing the signs i'm sure most people have got the idea by now but if is there anything else you would add to what you've already said uh, that when someone is sensing that or noticing it in someone else yeah uh, what... well i mean it's, it's harder when you notice it in someone else cuz you know i have this all the time i see people around me all the time who are eating and doing things and i think oh god that's a health disaster waiting to happen yeah but, okay well let's let's leave that aside because you know <laughs> they with, might not end up with, with yeah the, let's with stick, with the, 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 stick with the, to stick with someone yeah. i mean themselves. it's really it's really blunt and direct for fuck's sake listen that it really would be that blunt mm. um because if you're sensing that you're being your system's being pushed you have to listen before you end up in a much more complex much more difficult situation and you know don't think because you're younger or you know because you've had scrapes before just listen listen to the body and start learning what the what your body really really needs in order to flourish and and don't take chances on it because honestly I'm 33 years into this it, you know if I'd known what I know now when I was what 30 whenever it was that I first got ill I mean I could have saved myself and my kids and everyone who's ever loved me decades of challenges that perhaps none of us would rather have had Mm, yeah wow uh so i you've blown me away with your uh with with your wisdom and your heart and your courage um and thank you so much no, oh, thank you for inviting me. It's a genuine privilege, Ralph, and it's lovely to see you again. Yeah, you too. So you you have a a, a website. I do, I do indeed. Um, it's hypnocatalyst dot com. Hypnocatalyst, all one word. Yeah. I'll I'll link to those in um, uh, in the show notes and and Ooh. and the other things you mentioned. Um, and um. Yeah, I mean, uh, is there any any last thing you'd you'd want to end as, uh, to close up? Um, Not really. Just to kind of say to people that the most important thing they can ever do is get into these practices of self love in a very practical way, because actually, if they don't prioritize that, they can't adequately love or show up for others. Because we give out of an overflow of who we are, and if there's nothing there to give, we can't contribute. We can't contribute to the whole as you know, in the way that we can when we're really grounded in self-love, self-compassion. And, you know, what we're so often taught that selfish, it's the opposite. It's prerequisite for being able to be generous is having that abundant overflow of self. And so, yeah, doing all the self-work, the physical stuff, the psychological stuff, the emotional stuff skillfully, but at the same time realising that you're so much more than that little construct, so much more than that body system and just falling back into the expansiveness of who we truly are. Yeah, wise words. 